what you see, I mean, all the light you see is pretty much the planet, is the planet. Uh, the star has been completely uh, subtracted out. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? The James Webb Space Telescope is doing amazing things again. Now it's directly imaged its first exoplanet, HIP 64542b. Now, this is a gas giant that's roughly 10 times the mass of Jupiter. It's about 400 light years away, and it's incredibly young compared to the Earth, about 20 million years old compared to the Earth's 14 billion. But we've had ways of being able to detect exoplanets through transits and other indirect methods for many decades, well, not for many decades, but for a couple of decades now. So why is it so important to directly see and image these exoplanets. To help me dig into that, I'm very, very happy to say that we've got the fantastic Julian Girard back to talk to us. Julian, how are you doing? Uh, pretty good, except I got COVID yesterday, so I'm going to cough maybe during the interview. I'm a little bit yeah, tired. We're going to be gentle with, uh, <laughs> with, with Julian today because he's... Uh, He's feeling a little bit under the weather, so we're we're very very uh, we're very very grateful to have him back. So so just a, a reminder for the people who will be who will be watching, um, Dr. Girard is a physicist and an astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, where he is part of the JWST NEACAM team, and his research focuses on constraining our understanding of the demographics, formation, and migration mechanisms of long period giant extrasolar planets. So. Julian, this observation is uh, is very much in your ballpark, right? Yeah, it, it's exactly what I've been uh, contributing to in the past uh, maybe 15 years mm. uh, all from the ground and now from space, basically trying to image directly those um, large separation, um, young gaseous Jupiter-like planets. So before we get into the uh, the specifics of the images we got from from JWST yesterday, let's get rid of the uh, the banner there. Why do we need to do these these direct images? If we have ways of looking for exoplanets already through indirect mes uh, indirect um, methods such as transits, as we see here, or radial velocity methods, things like this, why do we actually want to go to the the length of trying to actually? see these things what's the what's the value in doing that well i mean you see you see them directly so the, the, what you're what <laughs> you're measuring it, yeah what you're measuring is the the actual photons of the planet yeah um i mean indirect methods are now well understood and you know false positives uh, are, are are well known you know like uh, stellar activity can cause both positive in transit and uh, also in radial velocity method. Mm. Um, direct imaging also has a false positive, you know, like since what we're looking for is basically a little blob of light, um, you can easily, um, you know, take another blob of light for, for it. But so so they all have their, their, their issues, but the, the big advantage of direct imaging is that if you manage to separate the planet and you manage to see it directly, um, you can also, after, you know, have a spectrograph and, and take a direct spectrum of it. Yeah. So instead of measuring, um, you know, in trans transmission spectroscopy, uh, when the, tr the transiting method, you know, when you have the planet passing in front of the, of the star, yeah. and so you have some of the starlight that is absorbed basically by the planet's uh, atmosphere, uh, it's not directly the planet that you're looking, you're looking at some kind of... Uh, it's a bit like a lithographic technique somehow, you know, like, like a kind a, of convolution of yeah. the stars well, chemistry with the atmosphere that you have to sort of disentangle, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's very powerful. I, I'm really not saying, you know, they're all complementary, those methods. Mm. Um, the, so the, the other advantage of doing the direct imaging is that if you have several epochs, if you come back and observe the same planet um, many times over the years, you can you can see it move. You know, it, it moves pretty slowly. Usually there are large separations, so the, the orbital periods are hundreds of years, but uh, you can see them moving. Uh, and then you can actually fit an orbit. If mm -hmm. you fit an orbit, you can get uh, what we call dynamical masses. So you can you can constrain the mass better than uh, models can do it. You know, models that they, 
that are using the the, the color that we measure with the different filters, etc. So usually we have to kind of make some assumptions when we when we see these transits or when we see these radial velocity measurements. We've got to put some assumptions in there then to get at masses and sizes and these kind of things. Well, yeah, yeah. so radial velocity is very, very powerful uh, for planets that are usually pretty close, mm. closer to their um, mm. stars. In some occasions, they detected planets that are actually long period, but it takes a lot of years to actually uh, Fit those, integrate uh, enough data to be able to see yeah. that, that interaction. Um, but the, the big drawback of uh, re, uh, radial velocity is what you measure is a minimum mass. Mm. Uh, you know there's a planet that is uh, somewhere above that mass, and that's that's it. That, you, know, you don't know the inclination of the system. And so since you measure uh, m sine sin, sin i, i is the inclination and m is the mass, um, direct imaging in some cases, especially if you fit mm. an orbit, can allow you to get the mm. eye, and then you constrain very well the the the, the planet mm. uh, dynam dynamical, you know, the system yeah. dynamical. Um, so, uh, so we take out some of the some of the unknowns that go into that um, that that kind of model that we were using before, and obviously that gives us, like you say, a better constraint on what the what the system is actually like. I, I guess with these, um, with this direct imaging method as well, and you kind of hinted at it there, if the planets are further away from the star and they're longer period, there's going to be a weaker gravitational interaction between the planet and the star. Like you were saying, it's going to take longer to kind of see any impact on that radial velocity measurement. And also, I guess they transit in front of the star very, very infrequently. If we think of the, the kind I mean, of orbital periods of like a Neptune or a, or he, or usually, you, usually, you know, like the transiting planets are, are usually edge-on system. Yeah. You know, you, if if a system is face-on and the planet does this, yeah. never going to transit. Yeah. If it's halfway, maybe it's going to transit if you're lucky. Yeah. And if it's completely edge-on, eventually it's going to transit. Uh, so, it could so, be, so it could be a really slow transit if it's far away, or it could not even be be visible at all from the Earth, depending on the the geometry yeah. of the system. Yeah, so so all the methods have, have their advantages and drawbacks, like transit method is extremely good to go down in mass and, and also to detect uh, those very low mass planets, like Earth-like planets around uh, small stars like TRAPPIST-1. Yeah. Um, and, and also like, like those small stars that are close by, uh, the planets are actually very close, but they it's like a scaled down yeah, yeah. version of our solar system, whereas what we're looking at uh, with direct imaging is a scaled up <laughs> and young um, version of the solar system. So it's covering another another regime of planetary formation as yes. well. So, so yes, and, and all these demographics is important to understand uh, the, differ the, the different formation scenarios and the different uh, migration scenarios because, um, for example, the hot Jupiters that we detect with transit but also radial velocity, like 51 peg B, for example, the first one that was detected in 95 uh, by the RV me method. Um, those, they, you know, they have a, they orbit in like three days or something or three, four days. And um, uh, we think they formed far away and then they migrated inwards mm. and got kind of locked around their star or something like that. You know, I'm not, I'm not a theoretician, but, uh, and the planets that we observe, like the ones you're showing right now, this is the one of the most famous system because they are, there are four planets known to date. Uh, they are all like between seven and tw 10, 12 uh, Jupiter masses. Mm. Um, it's face on. So you can imagine that if they were a debris disk, it, it would be completely like a, almost like a circle. Um, and and th those motions that you see, it's, uh, I forgot, but it's something like 15 years of data. Yeah. Almost, you know, detected that Keck, this is Keck data uh, with adaptive optics. Um, these these ones they were done by Hubble, by the way, but like you could barely see. Uh, I think three of them. I'm not sure you could see the fourth one. That's that's really close. Yeah. Um, with Web, uh, we're gonna do them too. There are programs that are in the pipe in the in the queue if you want. Um, but it's tough. It's tough because you know this is a 10 meter telescope with a larger angular separation power. Yeah. Uh, we have a six meter telescope with uh, JWST, so it's a little bit harder. And also, we operate at longer wavelengths. Yeah. 
So, you know, lambda over D is basically your beam <laughs> size. Working uh, against you all the time. Your resolution power or your beam size is basically uh, a little bit worse than uh, on the ground in this case. On the other hand, we, have, we are more stable, you know, uh, we are more sensitive at infrared wavelengths because we're super cold. Yeah. So it's possible that we see other planets that we missed mm -hmm. because they were too faint and far away, you know, like more than one arc second away, uh, but they were too cold. Uh, or low mass, and we did miss them, and they were, they're going to pop out. I mean, we don't know. We think there are not that many planets like that, but we we have to. You, know, you have that's to it. look. You have to. Look. If you don't look, you never you never know. So we'll uh, yeah. we'll say, we're going to come on to that in a second. I just wanted to to ask. So that so that all sounds absolutely amazing. So it begs the question: Why don't we do this direct imaging all the time? Why is it why is it so incredibly difficult to to do this direct imaging? Why why is it such a a difficult thing to get going. Yeah, so so first of all, the ratio, the brightness ratio between star and planet is huge. Yeah. Um, so to give you an idea, the, the one that was e announced yesterday uh, and that was discovered in 2017, but you know, imaged by JWST and announced yesterday, uh, the brightness ratio is about 10,000. Yeah. That's a lot. It's not that much. We can with current technology that's pretty easy actually but uh and, and why is it only ten thousand? that's because this planet is still super young and super hot yeah. it's about uh 1400 uh, degrees centigrade i mean it depends on the model uh, and the interpretation it's not uh rock solid i mean it's actually gaseous so it's not never gonna be rock <laughs> solid but <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> pun yeah. was definitely intended there, but yes, it was okay. intended. <laughs> no, no. So, but it, it's it's about the you know. So it's it's pretty hot. You, you have to imagine a, a young Jupiter that shines um, like a little bit like a, a lighter yeah. uh, type of flame, you know, yeah. uh, and, and and glows basically in the in the infrared. Um, the size is more or less like Jupiter, a little bit bigger. I think I think the the fit that we did uh, found like one point four yeah. Jupiter radius. So it's it's you know it's a little bit uh, young and scaled up version of Jupiter. Um, it's very close also to what we call brown dwarfs. Mm. You know, like those failed stars uh, that are you know just like that, but they burn, they burn stuff like deuterium. And so that's why we have a separate category um, between, you know, those giant planets and, and stars. Um, but so, basically, so, so in this case, so, so, that so, ratio, that ratio of brightnesses, it usually it, the, the star completely swamps the planet here. It's still 10,000 to one, yeah. but, but it's not, it's something that we can resolve with the technology that we... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So 10,000 to one, it's actually something that we've been doing for 10, 15 years yeah. or so from the ground, more or less, uh, especially with post-processing techni techniques getting better. Yeah. Uh, we, we subtract a star that doesn't have a planet to the, to the star that has the planet on top yeah. of occulting the, the light with the chronograph. You know, So it's a two-step process. So, so that's um, the process I want to come on to now. So obviously this is... This is incredibly difficult getting that that tiny little little point source of light from the planet away from the background of the star. I think they 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 describe it as something like trying to see a fire a firefly in front of a you know like a floodlight or a, light, or a yeah. lighthouse. So so what are those two steps? You mentioned there um, a coronagraph straight away, and then the post processing. So so how do we get around this problem that you have this massive bright star in the middle and, and potentially yeah, so coronagraph. Um... Uh, you know, the name comes from the, the solar corona and it, they started to use coronagraphs on the sun basically to see the the corona, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's what happens also during a solar eclipse, almost yeah. perfect, perfectly like that. Um, I think this is, uh, yeah, so, so, so here you can see protuberances of the sun that you would never see if you don't block the light of the sun, right? Yeah. Um, in our case, it's a little bit the same. Um, we block the, the star with a physical mask in the focal plane. So that would be, uh, you know, where it says chronograph image mask. Yeah. That, that would be something that's inserted in the beam in the case of NearCam. Um, so and it's, then, almost, it's almost like putting your, 
your kind of finger up in front of the sun so that you can see things on yeah, the other so side almost. I mean, there, there, are, there are new technologies that do this in a smarter way. In fact, uh, for Miri, it is what we call a face mask. So it's actually uh, killing using interferences and polarization, uh, the starlight in a more smart way I, with the condition that you have to be perfectly centered in the center, which is uh, not, you know, not necessarily very easy to achieve. But for Niacam, it's basically a physical, so, so it's, a, it's a substrate of sapphire where there is like uh, some, some sort of metal deposition on it. And it has roughly a round shape. And we have other ones that have different shapes basically. Um, and the ID, I don't know if you have an image for that. Um, yeah, the ID is to block the starlight. Uh, for, for near cam? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I have uh, another image apart from uh, in, in my In my paper, they, there is something like that. But okay. uh, in the thread also, like somewhere down in the thread. Uh, I can have a look. In this thread? Maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, anyway, we have that, but, the, but then... Uh, the, the little red triangle that you see in the center of this image, this is basically a wedge. It's basically some kind of prism that shifts the beam, you know, uh, introduces a tilt in the, in the beam so that we can see the chronograph on the detector. Otherwise, it's out of the field of view. And that was kind of an elegant uh, design so that uh, chronographs would not affect at all uh, observations uh, without chronograph, you mm -hmm. know, so... Uh, in the case of Miri, it's a bit different, you know, like the chronograph is always sitting in the focal plane. So uh, when you do imaging on the left, you have like the four chronographic field of views that are somehow a little bit affected by the presence of the oh, chronograph. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So, 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 so first, so the first step is sort of a physical, a physical block, if you will, just to kind of try and get most of the light yeah. away. And And then you said, once you've done that, obviously you're still going to be left with, with some starlight spilling over and and things like this, or, or light from other sources, and then, yeah, and so then well, you go and do some post processing as well. No, so before the post processing, okay. there is like what we call a Leo stop, and that's from Bernard Leo, you know, one of the, the inventor of the chronograph. Yeah. Um, and what we call the Leo chronograph is the combination of a focal plane mask, the one we just talked about. Yeah. And some in the pupil plane, so where the the red triangle is. Um, that's basically the, the same plane of the telescope primary mirror, you know, the pupil. Uh, we put a, a, a strange mask that will basically, it's undersized. So it's going to um, block out all the diffracted light that's remaining from the, from the occulted star. Ah, amazing. Yeah. Um, I could show you if you want the what it looks like sort of in the pupil plane. But um, so, and... Uh, and that's why, in the case of Nirkam, the planet has this uh, shape of a flower or a snowflake. You know, like it, it, it's not like just a point star, a uh, point planet in this case. Like every every star or planet or any object that is pointy, uh, point-like in the field would would have this shape. Uh, the same way, you know, um, the JWST uh, image is already like a, 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 has six primary pikes, you know, because of the shape of the mirror. We talked about this shape. Uh, this, this, this same way, in chronography, we select just like pieces of, of those, yeah. you know. we So it looks a little bit like, a, you know, like a Gruyere type of uh, mask. <laughs> I think we're going to see so these, the... <laughs> these odd shapes when we, when we come to talk about these images, yeah. Yeah, and that's why them. we have this weird uh, PSF shape in the case of Nirkam. Yeah. In the case of Miri, it's actually a bit less weird. <laughs> Excellent, and and then you go to the post processing where I guess you, you you have some model of how the of the of the background light that you would expect, or maybe some empirical measurements of the background light, and then you kind of remove that from the image as well to well, to just no, it's actually the the, no? the 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 technique the base the base techniques is simpler than that. Okay, um, <clears throat> we uh. So we, we, we put the star of interest with, with planets, let's say, uh, behind the mask. We get an image. Uh, it's already, the star is already attenuated, but it's not enough. Yeah. There's still a, a huge glow and what we call speckles around it. Uh, then we observe another star that we say it's a reference star. Ah. It's a star we know there's nothing around. Yeah. 
and it has the same brightness or sometimes a bit yeah. brighter uh same same spectral type more or less and not too far in the sky so that the telescope doesn't have to move too much um we observe that star actually with with little movements but, you know to to introduce a little bit of diversity in case we were not perfectly behind the mask yeah and then and then we subtract out the remaining glow from the reference star to the remaining yeah. glow from the star of interest yeah and that's how you get um the image that you see uh, with the, the the planet um and what we call post processing in this case is that in fact we have a bunch of frames for each and we use what what we call a principal component analysis it's a it's a pretty old uh, engineering technique to uh, uh subtract in the smartest possible way um it's not a direct subtraction. Basically, you, you give it more importance to what look what, what looks the same in your in your two images. Yeah. That's kind of like the way to explain it. Um, and so we do that, and in the end, we we are left with even less glow of the star, and and hopefully the planet pops out. Um, Amazing, and it definitely does yeah. in the images we're gonna we're gonna look at in a second. So so just to be just to be clear for everyone, this isn't the first direct image of an exoplanet this was done back in the kind of early 2000s we had these ones yeah. from Keck and and uh no, this and, one is from NACO actually VLT and, and the VLT in, in Chile yeah. that's right yeah so we had the ones from Keck and from and from VLT in in the early 2000s also it's not even the first one in in space because I believe and you and you kind of mentioned it that that Hubble yeah. has had uh has has had a go a couple of these as well um this one in uh 2010 and 2012 uh, the FOMO home. Uh, we don't. We don't system. really know what this one is actually, but it's, 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 it's <laughs> they, they something go. that's moving in the system, and that's not uh, speckle. Uh, so there is something, but uh, you know, there is a bit of controversy in, in what it is ah. in this case. So maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe we are getting one of the one of the first ones in space then. So and and, and we should say as well, this isn't. Um, the first sort of detection of an exoplanet that, that JWST has done because it's done this indirect um, transit of, of WASP 96B as well, but it is the first direct. So we talked about these indirect with the, with the transits and the radial velocity, but this is the first, the first direct where you say we're actually seeing the photons um, yeah. from the planet. So just before we look at the, the images that came out yesterday, you, you kind of mentioned a, um, a, a couple of points on this. Why, why is JWST, or what are the advantages of doing this kind of direct imaging with JWST relative to, say, just letting Keck or VLT handle it or or someone else? Because obviously um, JWST has a lot of, uh, you know, pressures on its time at the moment. Is, is it because it's got better wavelength coverage and, and these kind of things? Uh, yes. So, so. You know, from the ground, there are certain uh, wavelengths in the infrared you cannot access because it's it's blocked by the the Earth's uh, atmosphere. Yeah. Um, and so that's why you know on the ground we 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 talk about J band, H band, K band, yeah, yeah, yeah. L band, except because those are the bands where the absorption is not hundred percent. You know, so that those are the filters we get uh, on the ground. In space, we don't have no constraint whatsoever, so we. Yeah. The filters are defined differently, and they map out the whole uh, spectral range. Yeah. Um, on top of that, on the ground, we detected a few planets at uh, 4.5, 4.8 microns, but never above. Because above, you know, like the the telescope shines, the atmosphere, sh the, the the sky shines. You know, you're basically trying to uh, you have to remove all this background. Uh, and, and the, the, you know, we use clever techniques like uh, chopping the telescope, moving like that. So you can subtract very in a very fast, uh, high pace, yep. the background as it's changing, you know. But still, even with that, uh, the we haven't been able to, maybe we could do a few, and maybe the future telescopes or, or instruments will, will, will do a few at 10 micron from the ground. Yeah. But uh, it would be very, you know, like in, in the case of Miri and Nearcam. So Nearcam at uh, two to five micron and Miri uh, 10, 11, 15, and 23. Yeah. Those are the three, uh, the four um, wavelengths for chronography. Uh, you know, the planet we just saw, we can probably see it in one minute or, or two minutes. You yeah. know? 
uh it's it's really really sensitive you know like we we wanted to do a slam dunk and so we observed <laughs> longer but uh i'm pretty sure uh with a different strategy with shorter exposures with nick near cam i'm pretty sure in each minute we would we would see the planet because the one i the paper i, I published for commissioning it yeah. was also a ten thousand contrast object and it was in fact even closer to the star it's it's not a planet it's a white dwarf but uh, mm. it was like a test case to to show that it was working yeah and uh so it's same contrast but even closer into the mask where the yeah. the attenuation is actually affecting and for this one we did we did a different strategy in the readout of the detector and i can see the planet on each 1 minute frame yeah. i mean the not the planet the companion yeah <laughs> and it's the same so it's working really really well and, and, and yeah, those advantages of jwst like you said nobody's really you mentioned this in a tweet as well it's difficult from the ground to go beyond this five microns but when you're in space you've got this very stable telescope very very super cold going above five microns not a problem and you can get that that continuous spectrum yeah, so of, of the planet so it's Work out more things about it it's complementary the ground has mm. uh slightly can can go a little bit you know close can look yeah. a little bit closer to the star yeah we and and the space a little bit further has a better sensitivity and so mm -hmm. we we will find stuff i mean and we will characterize stuff that we already know yeah um, and then okay the other advantage huge advantage of direct imaging it's it's the future <laughs> yeah. you know because uh, the transit method is very is great and that's actually the probably the the most transformative method uh, with JWST because you know it's going to allow to look for uh, biomarkers or something like that around yeah. um, you know very very low mass planet like Earth in the trappy system etc. Uh, but but the thing is that to get to those measurements you need a lot of transits and it's kind of time consuming too yeah. you know and um, because first of all, it's only a few that transit uh, when you want and, and often, et cetera. Uh, and then you need a lot of um, a lot of transits to to achieve, you know, a, a further, um, you know, accuracy in your measurements. And so, in the future, imagine you can you you go from ten thousand or one hundred thousand. I think we can already do probably if we observe a long time and. Uh, make sure all the techniques are, are perfectly performed. I'm, I'm sure we can do 100,000, maybe almost a million contrast yeah. in some case uh, with uh, near cam. Uh, with Miri, maybe a bit less contrast, but the you know the objects will pop out uh, because of their uh, temperatures. Um, so, but still, you know, to directly image an Earth-like planet, you need like a, almost a billion contrast. Yeah. So, yeah. That's why uh, J JWC is never going to image an Earth-like planet, mm. uh, exoplanet. You know, it's going to maybe do Saturn masses. Uh, you know, this in this paper, our limits are already about one Saturn mass. Yeah. So like, uh, it's 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 pretty good. Um, but in the future, if you can build a new telescope with wavefront control, uh, and that's the goal of the technology demonstrator of the roman mission yeah and then like there are some plans to to build like uh, bigger missions like louvoir slash arabex like this would be uh yeah this is roman um so roman's going to do reflected light in the visible it's going to do like the same giant planet but in the visible we we hope to see them basically like we see jupiter in our night sky um uh, and then the future mission somewhere like 20 years from now or maybe more uh the goal is to go to the 10 to the 10 contrast or something wow. like that 10 10 billion and there you know if we look at certain um, stars that are nearby we hope to actually see directly uh, a few tens maybe a few or a few tens of uh, earth like planet and then you can do a, a low resolution spectrum um and and see you know see directly uh the atmospheres of those yeah, of those yeah, yeah. Very interesting because I was I, that's that's a question I was going to ask at the end was can we get down to that that level of looking at a, a kind of Earth like or, or maybe habitable planet but I guess we can't do that now but the hope is in the future 
as we get that contrast better, as the post processing gets better, these kind of things that that maybe we will be able to do that in the next kind of generation. Yeah. <laughs> when I will be old if I, <laughs> if I survive COVID. <laughs> So let's have the uh, let's have the big reveal then. So so here are the here are the uh, the beautiful images that we got of Hip six four five four two B, very catchy name. So so you just tell us a, a, a little bit about about what I think we're you seeing. You said here. six four twice, but it's six five four six five four. Sorry, sorry. Different phone number. Be careful. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> call someone else. They end up talking, you know, hundreds of light years away across the galaxy somewhere. Yeah. So, <coughs> sorry. Um, yeah. In fact, this this um, this planet is going to be renamed. Uh, there's there's uh, uh, in you know the International Astronomical Union finally started to do uh, their um, a little bit of a public outreach yeah. thing where people can propose names with nice. a lot of rules actually. And this so is is it, it going to be two... Girard Girard one? No, or... no, no, it's no? not. I think one of the rules is that you cannot name it after the uh and I, I i was not the first author neither <laughs> in 2017 i was on the paper but and neither yeah. yesterday so um no and and it's not going to be the the people that discovered it it's going to be you know something something M and something else yeah. uh, and but but there are a bunch of i think they have like 10 or 15 planets and two of them are direct imaging planets yeah. uh in the batch and, and this is one of them so it's going to be renamed you know at some point to, to something more colloquial that, that yeah you know, so, something that, uh, something like this or... yeah okay uh, some enlightenment uh yeah. one b yeah something a bit more catchy than that looks like a, uh, a I, fake I, I really it look, that looks like a fake twitter name or something you know it's uh yeah but you know we we don't really mind i mean so far we have about 20 of those uh direct directly imaged uh planets so we can recognize pretty easily the the phone number names. Yeah, yeah. once you get used yeah. to them. So what are we what are we seeing in these different <laughs> images? Then I guess these are these are different wavelength bands of seeing the the same thing. Yeah. So so the image above is a white field survey, uh, uh, just to to show the context where the star the star is. Yeah. Uh, and then there's this zoom uh, in, in insets where you see two images of NIRCAM. Uh, the purple one is at 3 micron. The blue one is at 4.4 micron. And then you see two mirror image, one at 11 micron and one at 15 micron. Yeah. So that, that's why you have those numbers. Those are the names of the filters. Ah. Uh, and then, so what you see, I mean, all the light you see is pretty much the planet, is the planet. Uh, the star has been completely uh, subtracted out, and it, it, the star is re represented by the little white symbol of a star, just to show. So, so that's the position, position where it is, but yeah. we're not seeing the actual light no, coming from not, it. Yeah. No, if if you want to see planet and star at the same time, it's just impossible. Yeah. In this case, ten thousand contrast. Yeah. You know? yeah. So so this is after post processing. This is basically. The, the image in the paper, except it's been, you know, PR'd a little bit by the, the <laughs> outreach team. So, but that's basically what you see. Uh, it's so, so it's 1400 degrees approximately uh, centigrade. So it's hot. And it's, it, so if you imagine a black body uh, radiation at, at this temperature, it, it shines pretty, yeah. you know, it's thermal, it's thermal light directly from the planet yeah. uh, atmosphere um at, at those uh four wavelengths and we have seven wavelengths in the paper so and and you mentioned the uh the different shapes so so this is simply to do with the optics of uh of near, of near cam being different yeah. the two on the left being different to the optics of miri on the right where yes. it's, it's more of a of a kind of circular pattern with with miri and and more of a a kind of segmented pattern with uh with near cam yeah exactly exactly so so you see you see like a core a bright core you see two little uh <clears throat> two 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 little uh, wings kind of looks like a defocused image of the of the hubble uh, space telescope which I, I think you mentioned in your <laughs> i made i made a i tried to be funny yesterday I made, <laughs> I made a meme, but it's not that funny i, I saw but you've got to be funny. careful because the mr chorizo i can't remember his name got in trouble right so we got to be uh i, I, I noticed uh, yeah. you put like 
obviously fake all yeah. over it just to uh, well, exactly i put off. obviously i put fake on it mm. i put i put a cucumber slice instead of the star so that it's kind of <laughs> okay. but yeah i mean okay maybe you find, find that funny but my you know younger generations might not <laughs> anyway and then you see uh, six um satellite spots which are uh, a bit fainter in, in this case they've been made a little bit fainter by by the I guess by the PR process a little bit. Um, and those are satellite spots also light from the planet. It's all light from the planet here. The the noise in the back could be a little bit of star left and so but, so, like, so, so those... the sort of the, the wider rings you mean is is, is yeah. stuff we haven't still haven't been able to remove even with with all the oh, no, you, 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 no no so the, the six spots you cannot remove them okay. unless you evolve the image. Yeah. Unless you take uh, out the the Fourier transform of the optics, yeah, or whatever exactly. It is, yeah. Unless unless you backward yeah. correct the image, uh, and then you add noise if you do that. So yeah. so you don't necessarily want to do yeah. that. Yeah. In yeah. fact, we we have a smart way to retrieve the planet flux. You know, we yeah. we use the same shape uh, as as you see here to actually retrieve everything yeah. possible. Yeah. We don't use just a little uh, aperture in the center. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's 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 a it's a, it's truly amazing stuff, and and I guess this the beautiful thing here is having the two instruments as well, and having that such beautiful images from both gives you great confidence in what you're seeing as well, which is you know really yeah yeah yeah. I mean, I mean, this one is is super known. Uh, yeah. So I mean, it's this this is a slam dunk. This is a low hanging fruit, uh, <laughs> and that's why that's why it was chosen by the early release science team. Yeah. Uh, the, the the goal of those uh, ERS teams is to really uh, showcase what uh, the telescope can do at the beginning, you know. So it we're not we don't go fishing for new planets. We yeah. just like show, you know, on this known planet that's what we get. It's, it's the same as we did when when the Large Hadron Collider was turned on. Like the first the first year or two was just <laughs> reproducing plots from like previous experiments and making and showing that we got improvements on those in terms of resolution and, and these kind of things. It makes, it makes complete sense. And you mentioned, I think, I think somewhere, if I've got the, the tweet that this, this was the, was this the last, um, this, uh, coronagraphy was, that was the last kind of science mode to, to come online. And I think you were still feverishly working away on it while, uh, while Biden was showing the images and they were coming out. The yeah, there, it, right? it was kind of it was completely crazy. Uh, this is from July 10th, so one day before uh, Joe Biden showed the, the first ever. You're still in the office trying to get the thing working on the last moment. Yeah, and and so we were the 17th out of 17. Like everything was science ready except for us yeah. uh, near cam coronography, and um, we we had those uh, issues. You know, this red little triangle that was showing basically. Uh, you don't have to show it, but uh, there was a small misalignment and we basically had to fix it 1.5 million kilometers away. Uh, it took several weeks to actually, because the software, yeah. the in-flight software didn't really uh, allow us to turn a, any wheel and take data at the same time. So we had to, to find a clever way yeah. in different steps to get there. Uh, finally, we, we were pretty well, uh, you know, aligned and, and, and calibrated. And we, I, you know, we had this data to take on this white dwarf companion, the one that I, I published. Yeah. Uh, this was like the the final um, demonstration that everything worked. In fact, it's a it's it's a perfect demonstration yeah. that the ERS science will work right after, right? Yeah. And we got the data on July six, and I had to turn in my slides for the readiness review on July 9th. So I, wow. I only had three days um and one of my colleagues was on vacation the other the other one that was helping me out had covid <laughs> and so we were really a small team yeah like it was it was really like thankfully we we had worked so well together uh the tools at this point were sort of working enough to get this contrast curve and yeah. uh you know the companion image yeah. so in fact we got it within hours and then it was all a matter of presenting to the big management of NASA and the Space Telescope Science Institute, etc., that you know, convincing them that even though it's not 100% perfect, we can still improve. Yeah. Uh, it's good enough to pursue uh, and go and move on with the science measurements. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, and and that's what we did, and and that's why we have this planet now. <laughs> the, the 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 final thing that I sort of noticed as an interesting point was uh, one one of your colleagues was was uh, was uh, mentioning that, or, or I can't remember if it was a journalist or one of your colleagues was flagging it's a, up. It's a, it's a student in our group. A uh, student in your group. Ne nearly, you nearly got scooped on this by uh, by people who were looking through the data because the data, um, you know, pipeline is so good. That, that people yeah, and, and, and for, for the early release science, all the data was immediately public. Yeah. Uh, and and that's why, you know, you have people like Jody Schmidt uh, uh, making some post-processing and stuff like that. And, pe and, and people get involved, which is great. Yeah. For this uh, program, in fact, yeah, for NIRCAM, uh, for me, it was not the case because of the, some background issue. But uh, for NIRCAM, uh, hours after the observations, we had those <laughs> images that already showed the planet very clearly, you know? It's yeah. not exactly as good as in the paper, but it's, yeah. it was actually a very good quick look. And so I immediately sent this to the collaboration and I said, hey, we have it. Uh, in the meantime, Erin Carter, the lead author, he already had made one in one filter, but I was like, hey, these are the five filters of yeah. Um And, um, and yeah, and and some people on 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 Reddit somehow like like it seems like Reddit is kind of like the <laughs> the social network of like people that are a bit more like uh, geeky and yeah. <laughs> they dig and stuff. Uh, so some people on on Reddit um, download downloaded the images. I don't know if it was you know the FITS files or the JPEGs or and made some kind of color image. Yeah. On, and it looks actually pretty good. Yeah. And uh, well, it looks more or less like that, but but stacked. Yeah. And and everyone in the com in the comments is like, no, that that's probably not it. You have a problem with your post processing <laughs> and stuff like that. And the star looks the stars look weird and stuff. And yeah. and uh, and so we saw it. We saw it, and we were tempted to actually communicate mm -hmm. with something like that, saying like, hey, uh, it's coming. Uh, we're working on it. Yeah. Um, to not get scooped and also to <laughs> engage the but some, somehow we decided not to do it so we, we decided just to work about a month on the making a, a you know a decent paper uh, yeah. and just like hold off and I'm, I'm glad basically it didn't go from reddit to facebook yeah, to Twitter yeah of course yeah, yeah otherwise uh you know and and we you know it's it's a team of 100 people so it's a lot of the people in this field and so People kind of agreed not to um, not to uh, say anything until the paper would be published. At least it well, shows. At least it shows the interest in uh, you know in in the work again, and also as it's as it's kind of alluded to here, the quality of the uh, of the data flow that's going out in public as well that people can have a look at if they're interested. So, so that's clearly you know a very high quality if they're able to pull these kind of things out from from that data. So that's nice to nice to see at least, I guess. Yeah, the, the the funny thing is like the archive. It's actually not so easy to use. You you, you need to to play a little bit yeah. with it. It's yeah. Kind of a really massive uh, website <laughs> archive. With a lot of missions, a lot of instruments. Mm. Uh, you need an account. You need a token. You know, yeah. Like and so, but then once you get going, you know, you can actually look at the products and and you even get JPEG <laughs> images of those. You know, like it, sometimes it's not as good. You know. Um, and, and some of it is being reprocessed as yeah, we speak, yeah, in yeah, fact, yeah. because we got calibrations in flight that replace the calibrations that we had from the ground or some dummy files that we made in the in the meantime. And we are replacing those uh, files and improving the, yeah. the processing for, for all the modes and not just for chronography. Uh, and so, you know, you can find a new instance of the processing yeah, of the pipeline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But then, you know, in this field, if to publish in principle, you need to do your own stuff. You know, you, you need to go a bit further than just a quick look image. Yeah. So f f very final question, because uh, you should you should go and lay down again and, uh, you know, relax. You should be relaxing um, is where do we go from here? So what, what do we expect in terms of um, direct imaging from from JWST going forward? You talked about Roman coming online, but what can we expect in terms of looking at more more planets going forward with JWST. So Roman, you mentioned, but what about more direct so the, imaging with JWST? Can we expect more of so that? The, the, 
Yeah, the first year, the first year is already scheduled, you know, like it was decided before the launch. Uh, and so there are a bunch of uh, GTO, guaranteed time observations for, you know, that people that, that built the telescope or the instruments uh, got as a reward. And some of them are going to go after other low hanging fruits, basically. <laughs> so all the low hanging fruits of the, those kind of planets are going to be done more or less in the first year. These are good, uh, though, because like I said, it's almost it's commissioning and showing it's you, you're seeing what you expect. It's, it's all it's all kind of allows you to not only do science and show amazing images, but also calibrate and do the the kind of yeah. um, the kind of stuff you need to do on the technology side as well. It's, I mean, yeah. it's, it's the sensible way to, to go, right? Yeah, there are still some other sub modes, basically, it's, it's different masks that we haven't used yeah. here. So yeah. some of them are going to push the limits a little bit more. Like the, some of the uh, planets that are known are actually very faint, about 100,000 contrast. And, mm -hmm. and so they're, they're, this is going to be done in the next month, yeah. uh, next year, like within a year, let's say. And then um, I think at the end of the year, there will be a call for proposals for the cycle two. So the second year uh, and cycle two is going to be slightly more open to go fishing and discover something. Yeah. Yeah. Not exactly go fishing, but basically I, I would expect that. You'll uh, have to have a justification, but more, 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 for right, example, more like right a, to system, work. A, a system where you have uh, hints that there is a planet at large separation because of the disk's shape yeah. or because of some uh, some millimetric measurement with ALMA yeah. or because of some radial velocity, you know that yeah. it's possible to image it or something. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure the community is going to go after those yeah. in direct imaging. Amazing. And so it's, Amazing. yeah, it's, it's chronography. You can also do direct imaging of exoplanets without chronograph, but it's, you, you you know it's actually a little bit more efficient because you don't need to spend all this time to center the star and etc and you can do two uh two wavelengths at the same time with near cam um but of course you have these huge diffraction spikes that you have to subtract away yeah. so it, you know there are a few programs like that too that i'm interested in seeing what they what they do amazing julian thank you so much for taking the time today especially because you're uh you're not 100%, so I, I really, really appreciate it. Is there is there any way where, where you'd suggest people go to to find out more about this stuff? I'll link your uh, your excellent Twitter as ever, um, which has a lot of details on this. Anywhere else to, to yeah, find out about direct um, imaging and, and these kind of things? Yeah, so, okay, uh, let me find. There is this one little video that was made by my colleague, uh, Jaron Jar Ring okay. from Arizona, uh, and it's... It's a simulation of the near cam chronograph, but it, it's actually very didactic. So if you go to the bottom of this page, where did you send it? Uh, and there's a little movie. Did you? Where did you send it? On on Zoom. Uh, to the ah, chat. I've got sorry. it. Yeah, yeah, I've got it. Yeah. We can so bring you, that you go to the bottom of the page. There is, there is a little movie that explains the chronographic everything we talked about. Basically, uh, there's a model. Yeah, ah, this video. Excellent. Yeah. It's very short, but basically the star moves behind the, you know, the here in this case, it, it is moving the, the chronograph behind the star. It's kind yeah. of the same, you know? Yeah. And you see the attenuation in the middle. <laughs> this is the raw attenuation. So you see, it's oh, not wow. quite enough to see the planet. Yeah. And then on the right, it's after subtracting a star, uh, a, a separate star, a reference star. Yeah, and you yeah. start, in this case, uh, to... So, so, to, so, so uh, for people who are watching that... that, that the first the first kind of idea is that you're moving this uh this uh, mask this in mask in, into, yeah. into the into place exactly and this is just the amount of starlight which is removed so that you can kind of hope to see a planet but it's not yeah. enough to see anything yet enough. and then if you if you take away the reference of another star you can start to see the the planet sort of popping the out two planets so here there's one planet there's one which well. is ten thousand contrast the yeah. same as we did and you see it looks very much the same yeah uh, as in the paper, yeah. and the other one is hundred thousand. So, but it's a bit further away. So you can imagine hundred thousand closer at stuff. So there's a there's an interaction between the contrast and the <laughs> distance. If you can be further away, I guess you can get away with a lower contrast. But yeah, if you're closer, you you can't. Amazing, and that's a really really nice uh, image. I'll make sure that's, yeah, uh, I, that's I, down I, in the description I as well. We, I hope we can make one with more up to date 
uh, simulations and uh, maybe uh, the, the real image at the end, you know, when it's centered. But I, I, we have to see. Oh, that's really, really cool. Julian, thank you so much. I'm going to uh, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for, for taking the time again, like I say, especially when you're not well. And uh, no, this is really awesome stuff. Hopefully it goes from strength to strength. And uh, next time we have something like this, we'll uh, we'll get you back. And when you're feeling a little bit better and we'll uh, we'll chat again, buddy. All right. Thank you, Sam. Take care, buddy. Have, have a good time. weekend. Yeah. Talk to you soon. You too. Bye, -bye. Bye now. I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.